Bah, je vous souhaite euh, une très bonne soirée. Et de, et vous êtes euh, venus nombreux euh, aujourd'hui et écouter Monsieur euh, Nabil Mandar nous faire cette euh, conférence euh, ce soir. Et donc, euh, je m'appelle euh, Mathieu Forodou, je suis le coordinateur scientifique à l'Institut d'études avancées de Nantes. Et euh, je voulais remercier Monsieur Mandar d'être venu nous parler des réfutations euh, en arabe du Coran faites au milieu du XVIIe siècle par euh, Filippo Guadagnoli. Et avant tout, je voulais aussi euh, euh, vous adresser les meilleures salutations de Pascal Vieille, le, notre directrice, qui n'a pas pu euh, être présente ce soir car elle est euh, en déplacement euh, professionnel euh, en Afrique du Sud, au Cap. Et elle vous adresse toutes, euh, toutes ces salutations et je vous souhaite euh, une excellente euh, conférence et puis une semaine riche en, en, en dialogue et puis en, en réflexion sur, votre, sur vos recherches. Voilà. La conférence de ce soir est aussi le résultat d'une collaboration euh, scientifique et institutionnelle entre euh, le projet ERC EQ, la Maison des sciences de l'homme et euh, l'Institut d'études avancées euh, de Nantes. Cette, euh, cette conférence est assez importante pour nous, à double titre, je dirais. Tout d'abord, elle, elle s'inscrit un petit peu dans une sorte de tradition que nous aimerions euh, voir plus soutenue à l'avenir celle d'une ligne d'invitation euh, de chercheurs et personnalités de haut vol et portée en collaboration avec nos plus proches partenaires, que sont notamment euh, la Maison des sciences de l'homme et l'Université de Nantes. Elle est aussi euh, importante en ce qu'elle marque l'importance pour, pour l'IOA, euh, un de ses membres associés, puis, mais aussi euh, d'autres membres. Euh, je, là, je remercie John pour cette euh, initiative d'avoir euh, mis ensemble l'Institut, la Maison des sciences de votre euh, et votre projet et tous les chercheurs que vous avez invités. Voilà. Elle nous permet aussi de remercier publiquement un peu la, sa, votre contribution à la promotion de l'Institut et à son rayonnement scientifique à la fois tant au niveau local, national qu'international. Merci beaucoup John pour votre implication. La conférence de ce soir que M. Nabil Matar va nous fait l'honneur de donner dans cet amphithéâtre Simone Veil est l'occasion pour moi de souligner à quel point elle entre en résonance avec l'un des axes historiques de la politique scientifique de l'Institut, à savoir l'histoire et la sociologie des religions, euh, plus généralement. De nombreux, à ce titre, de nombreux chercheurs ont été accueillis ici à l'Institut, tant pour faire des conférences, mais aussi pour revenir en résidence de, de recherche sur une période annuelle d'octobre à juin, en règle générale, voire quelques cas rares euh, sur les cours, plus courts séjours, de trois à six mois, selon les situation. Le, donc, euh, je, profite, je profite un peu cette, pour vous dire que ceux qui ont soutenu leur thèse et qui souhaiteraient euh, faire un séjour de recherche à l'Institut en 2023-2024, que l'appel à candidature est ouvert jusqu'au 30 juin euh, pour euh, avoir accès à toutes les informations, etc. Je vous invite à consulter notre site internet et puis sinon bah, m'écrire euh, sur, euh, sur mon adresse que vous trouverez aussi, également sur... Euh, sur le site, voilà. Ceci dit, il y a un autre aspect aussi intéressant que, que là, cette conférence va aussi souligner, c'est le fait que la bibliothèque Julien Grac, qui est une, un service mutualisé entre la, la, la Maison des sciences de l'homme et l'IEA, accueille une collection assez riche d'ouvrages sur les, la question d'histoire et de sociologie des religions, collection nourrie à la fois par les, les dépôts d'ouvres de, d'achat de le, vos, vos ERC, donc d'abord euh, Relmin, puis maintenant EQ, mais aussi par un don que nous avons reçu de Émile Poula, qui est un historien et sociologue des religions, et qui nous a fait don de son l'intégralité de sa bibliothèque, de plusieurs euh, milliers d'ouvrages, on en a recensé à peu près 17 000, ainsi que sa son l'ensemble de ses archives personnelles et professionnelles lorsqu'il était euh, euh, membre du CNRS et puis euh, qu'il a dirigé euh, un des laboratoires euh, d'histoire euh, et de sociologie des religions à Paris. Euh, à l'UHESS. Donc ces, ces archives et collections d'ouvrages sont disponibles et vous pouvez à tout moment euh, demander à nos, aux bibliothécaires de, de les consulter. Ils se feront un plaisir de vous accompagner dans cette, euh, dans cette recherche. Nous avons aussi le, un, un plan d'archivage pour, euh, pour vous aider dans la, la découverte des, des cartons de, de documents euh, qui sont en, en réserve. Et pour conclure, mes remerciements vont aussi à, tous, à celles et ceux qui ont permis la, la réalisation et l'organisation de cette conférence. Je pense à Dimitri, mais aussi à Amanda et tous les autres qui ont bien voulu prêter main forte 
Voilà. Et avant de passer euh, la, la, la parole à, à John Tolan et ainsi qu'à Monsieur Nabil, Nabil Matar, je voudrais à nouveau vous remercier d'être là ce soir et je vous souhaite une excellente euh, conférence. Merci à vous. Merci beaucoup à Mathieu et, et merci à l'Institut. So many thanks to, uh, to all of you for being here, and it's a pleasure to see uh, fellows from the Institute uh, alongside uh, the doctoral students, uh, postdocs, and other researchers of the UQ project. Uh, as Mathieu explained, uh, this is uh, an institute, th this building is shared by the uh, Maison de Sciences de l'Homme, we heard its director this morning, Frédéric Leblay, and by the Institute for Advanced Studies. And uh, let me just repeat and emphasize what Mathieu said. Uh, if any of you uh, have projects you want to pursue and would like to uh, be in Nantes uh, with us for a year, don't hesitate to look online and uh, to apply for a one-year residency here. Uh, so it's uh, with great pleasure that I introduce my friend Nabil Matar. Nabil and I met in 1996 in Cairo uh, at a conference, and I still have no, no, not only fond memories of that conference, but also of a boat trip on the Nile we took <laughs> the, one evening. Uh, and we've met uh, a number of times since at conferences in the UK and the US uh, and, and elsewhere. Uh, and I've been hoping and plotting to bring Nabil to Nalt for many years. Uh, we've had a number of false starts, mostly because of COVID. Uh, and it's a great pleasure uh, that you're finally here. Uh, he was a little ill uh, earlier, uh, and we were wondering <laughs> if he would actually have gotten all the way to Nantes and not be able to speak to us, but we're delighted that you're here with us today. Uh, and thank you for making that, that effort to be with us. Uh, Nabil Matar, I think most of the people in this room know his work and have read uh, some of his many books. Uh, Nabil was educated at the American University of Beirut and at Cambridge University. He's taught in Jordan, Lebanon, and the US. He's currently Samuel Russell Chair in the Humanities at the University of Minnesota. Uh, and he's the author of numerous articles and books. I certainly won't try to cite all of them. Let me just quickly mention a few of them which have been particularly important for me in my research. Uh, Islam in Britain, 1558 to 1685, which he published in 1998. Uh, Turks, Mur Turks, Moors, and Englishmen in the Age of Discovery, published in 99. Uh, in the Land of the Christians, which is an anthology of Arabic travel writing in the 17th century, uh, which he in did an introduction to and, and translated. Uh, Mediterranean Captivity Through Arab Eyes, 1517 to 1798. Uh, Another book uh, that I used extensively for my uh, most recent book is uh, uh, Henry Stubb and the Beginnings of Islam, The Original and Progress of Mahometanism, uh, which was an edition of this uh, important uh, text on one of the first positive portrayals uh, of Muhammad by a European author. Uh, he also wrote British Captives in the Mediterranean Atlantic, 1563, and 17, to 1760, and you've got, I see you announced a book in progress, which was forthcoming soon, that I'm very much looking forward to reading, uh, which will be called Luther and the Papacy Through Arab Eyes, 1517 to 1798. So join me in welcoming uh, Nabil Matar. Thank you so much, John. Just want to make sure my voice is clear. Uh, and I wish to start by apologizing to John and to the Institute that I failed to be here in the morning. I wanted to be part of this conference from first time, you know, day one, but it has been a horrible four days. I hope it's getting out of the way. So my apologies for that. Uh, having done so, uh, I want to thank some people, first of all, definitely and mostly John, not only for the constant <laughs> perseverance, but also for his patience and endurance, because for the past like 36 hours, we didn't know whether I would be allowed to come here. I mean, they had taken a 
a COVID test. And so, you know, would I be positive or negative? I mean, I knew I was negative, but they had to do that. And anyway, until we found out, I could assure him I will be here. And I wanted to be here. This is a project I worked on for two years. And I've been discussing it with, uh, with uh, John for the last few months. And so I really wanted to be here. And this is a paper I've been working on for so long. So I'm very, very grateful for the opportunity to do that. I'm also grateful to Amanda, who has been most helpful in all sorts of ways. I'm a very impractical man. She seems to be a very capable woman. And so I really appreciate that of her. Uh, at a professional conference, you don't acknowledge people not involved in the conference. But I do wish to take this liberty of thanking my guardian angel, Amy Frankfurt. Without her, I don't think I would have been here. So thank you. Finally, I want to blame one person, and that is Guadagnoli. Uh, he's been my obsession for the past two years. And tonight, I hope I get back at him. In 1566, uh, this lecture may be long. Well, it will be long for two reasons. First of all, uh, Guadagnoli wrote 2,000 pages. And second of all, I'm not as feisty as I can be. So please bear with me. In 1566, three years after the conclusion of the Council of Nantes, uh, of Trant, <laughs> at the Qadil Aman al Masihiya, the belief of the Christian covenant was published. It was part of the missionary momentum promoted by the Council towards bringing the Maronites and hopefully Christians schismatics in the Arab East under the mantle of Rome. As printed books became crucial in the mission project, attention was turned to Muslims and three quarters of a century later appeared two Arabic tomes by Filippo Quadagnoli, who died in 1655, aimed at converting Muslims. The first was the Ijaba ila Ahmed al-Sharif ibn Zayn al-Abidin al-Farisi al-Isbani, which was based on his Latin apologia pro Christiana religioni, which had been published in 1631. The book was a gargant gargantuan, 1161 pages in quarto. Uh, there were lots of duplications, followed by an exhaustive table of contents, an index of 140 pages, which included reference to all the verses cited from the Bible and the Quran, four pages corrigenda, and an epilogue to the, uh, to the adept reader, al-Mahir, al-Qari al-Mahir. While there were various changes between the original Latin and the Arabic, Guadagnoli did not alter his hostile language about the Prophet and the Quran. I just included in the uh, handout a picture of the book. I actually went, I, as I say, he became an obsession. So I went to the one place I could get access to it, which was in, uh, in Berlin. And I requested special permission to take a picture of it, which they allowed me. <laughs> so there it is. The second book appeared in 1649. It was also published through the Propaganda Fide, another gargantuan book based largely on the Ijaba but with significant changes and additions. To appeal to Latin readers in Rome preparing for mission to Muslims, the syntactically confused Arabic title, Barahin Mukhtalifa fi ma huwa li shari'at Allah bil haq min al qasis al haqir Filippus Quadagnoli, was translated as Consideration ad Mohammedanus cum responsione ad objections Ahmed Fili uh, Zain al Abidin. The Arabic title did not mention the words Muslims or the Persian uh, whose objections to Christianity were being refuted. In this book, Guadagnoli removed much of the toxic language he had used in the Ijaba, but dictated to Muslims the Christian manner in which. <coughs> in which they should read and interpret their scripture. I quote, the Muslims and the people of the Quran should read it, should read this book, the Barahin, very carefully in order to learn and accept the truth of the Christian religion, end of quote. 
These two Arabic books were unparalleled in the early modern history of Christian Islamic polemic. First, they were the first European books against Islam that were written in Arabic and printed in Arabic. The books were published by the Propaganda Fide, the center for the accumulation and production of what Giovanni Pizzorusso called the Savoir Missionnaire. Unlike other works by early modern European scholars against or about Islam, the books were not aimed at the specialized coterie of fellow Orientalist or general uh, continental readers. Rather, they were sent to the Muslims and the Christians in the Middle East, in the middle of the Ottoman and Persian dominions and beyond. The books presented the, <coughs> the books presented the conversionary words of the Catholic Church to Arab uh, eyes. Finally, they were the longest and the most detailed attacks on the Quran in Arabic. As far as I know, and as anti-Islamic books go, there has been nothing like them in Arabic print, even during the imperial age of European mission in the 19th century. History of criticism. Guadagnoli's Arabic text attacked the Quran and Muhammad. Yet without exception, all modern historians, and I go back a hundred years, have either turned a blind eye to, or disingenuously skirted around, the denigration of the Prophet and the Quran. Nor has there been a study of the arguments, methods, and polemics in the book, even though no other European Arabist wrote as much as Guadagnoli did. In 1922, Louis Sheikho, the formidable Jesuit Iraqi Lebanese scholar priest, he's mixed of all, mentioned without commenting the 1637 and 1649 versions of Guadagnoli's books, treating them as the same. In 1965, Najib al aqiqi mainly observed in his encyclopedic three-volume work on al-Mustashrikun, the Orientalist, that Guadagnoli wrote, and I quote, a book of Christian disputation to which he appended selections from Arabic books. A quarter of a century later, in 1993, the Egyptian polymath Abdurrahman Badawi published his third and expanded edition of Mawsu'at al-Mustashriqin, Encyclopedia of Orientalists. He mentioned the two books by Guadagnoli, but did not comment on them. These writers were fully aware of the content of Guadagnoli's books, but did not describe them because they, did not, because they were cautious to not provoke Christian-Muslim tension. From the West, George Graff did not mention the Barahin and treated it as the second publication of the Ijaba. In 2004, article by Bernard uh, Heberger, who stated that the Ijaba, quote, was presented as using peaceful argument without contempt in order to increase interlocutors' curiosity and doubts before answering them with Christian theological arguments. Clearly, Heberger did not read the book. In 2007, Noel Malcolm wrote about the Barahin, Quote, some of the most polemical elements, such as denunciation of Muhammad as a hypocrite, were omitted in the later version, end of quote. He did not read the latter part of Barahin. Nor did he mention the Ijaba in his otherwise magisterial study of Islam in early modern European intellectual history, Useful Enemies. Thankfully, a few scholars studied the ecclesiastical and linguistic background of Guadagnoli's books and, and the role that Guadagnoli played in the translation movement. The work of Giovanni Pizzorusso and Aurelien Girard is most important here. So too is the detailed 2012 study by Andrea uh, Trentini, which argued that Guadagnoli tried in the Barahin to appeal to his Muslim readers by removing all the negative uh, descriptions of the Quran and of the Prophet. This view was adopted by Mercedes Garcia Arenal and Rodrigo Mediano in their 2013 chapter in Converted Muslims, writing about the Ijaba in the Christian Muslim bibliography in 2016, Alberto Tiburcio summarized the scholarly consensus. Quote, 
1631 edition is intensely anti-Islamic and full of ad hominem attacks on the Prophet, while curiously, the 1637 version shows an evolution toward a somewhat greater respect for the religion. The most important feature that distinguishes the Arabic adaptation of Apologia from the original Latin, especially the revised Consideratione ad Mohammedanus, is that it does not include the most confrontational ad hominem statements against Muhammad, end of quote. A year later, in 2017, Tuborco added that Guadagnoli, quote, omitted a part in which he accused the Prophet of Islam of being a hypocrite, end of quote. In 2018, Alexander Bevilacqua published The Republic of Arabic Letters, Islam and European Enlightenment, that was and praised the Barahin on the same ground that was mentioned above. That was the only reference he made to Guadagnoli's Arabic books, even though his study was about the European Republic of Arabic Letters, and Guadagnoli had been the most prolific European author in Arabic print. Any reading of the 2,000 plus pages by Guadagnoli will show that the Ijaba was not an evolution on Apologia, nor did the Barahin show, quote, respect for religion of Islam. The books were the Arabic Summa Contra Gentiles of early modern Catholicism. So why study them in this age of rampant Islamophobia? Focusing on these books will show the change in the European approach to Islam that was beginning to take place even during Guadagnoli's own lifetime. From Henry Stubbs, 1670s, The Rise and Progress of Mohammedanism, the first text to openly praise the Prophet Muhammad and the Quran in the European vernacular, and into the 18th century, the Quran played a central role in what Jan Loop has called the, quote, epistemological reconfigurations that are at the basis of modern Europe. Guadagnoli's polemical tomes show where the European Quran was in the first half of the 17th century, and where, to use Edward Said's term, it traveled. The Ijaba. Historical. The Maronite Druze papal connection. At the end of the Ijaba, Guadagnoli summarized the events that led to the writing of Apologia. The honorable, learned, faqih, the capable, perceptive Persian, whose name is Ahmed ibn Zayn al-Abidin, a native of Sfahan, read a book by a Jesuit about Christianity and wrote a battle against it in Pharisee, rejecting, quote, the mystery of the Trinity of God and the divinity of Christ. It reached Rome in 1625, whereupon Pope Urban VIII uh, tasked Bonaventura Malvasia with refuting it. In 1628, the Propaganda Fide published Malvasia's slim volume in Latin, which was 159 pages, to be followed in 1631 by Filippo Guadagnoli's <coughs> massive rebuttal, the Apologia. Apologia caught the eye of a Maronite by the name of Yusuf al Baslokiti from the village of Baslokit in blessed Mount Lebanon. Louis Shaikho added the family name Baklini, thereby locating Yusuf in the Druze part of Mount Lebanon. Yusuf read Apologia as a timely polemic against Islam and realized that an Arabic translation would help Catholic missionaries in the region in converting his non-Christian compatriots. At the time, the 1630s, there were no Arabic publications that presented Christian doctrine at the same time that they challenged Islam. The only Arabic publication available in Rome for, the, uh, for use by missionaries was 1590, 1591, uh, the Medici edition of the New Testament. But the text included illustrations inappropriately showing Jesus and others in Italianate clothes, aesthetically and theologically objectionable to both Muslims and Orthodox Christians, even Maronites. At the same time, it was full of grammatical mistakes, as the numerous letters sent from Aleppo to Rome repeatedly complained. After publication was the, another publication was the brief at the Qadil Amana al Masihi al Orthodoxia of 1595, a reprint of this 1566 original that urged Christians to obey the Pope, but without confronting Islam. 
and so was the and so was Cardinal Bellarmine's Doctrina Christiana, translated into Arabic by Yusuf's fellow Maronites, Jibrail Sohune and Nasrallah Shalak, in 1613, again emphasizing the primacy of Rome. In 1627, the Propaganda Fide published an Arabic commentary on Bellarmine's tract, but Tafsir Wasa ala Talim al Masihi, an expanded uh, kind of ex interpretation of the, of the Christian teachings, was in very poor Arabic as well as in very poor printing. Recognizing the need for a well printed Arabic book that directly confronted Islam, Yusuf supported the publication of the Apologist translation. And upon its appearance in print, the Arabic title page showed his name and contribution. You can see that on the uh, fly sheet. For Yusuf, conditions in Lebanon were propitious for Christian missions to Muslims and Druzes. In 1608, Prince Ferdinand de Medici, the Grand Duke of Tuscany, a fervent upholder of crusade and a staunch ally of the Pope, sent a delegate to the Maronite Patriarch and to the Druze Prince to Mount Lebanon, uh, Fakhreddin II, to discuss the possibility of a Christian Druze uprising against the Ottomans. As Brodel, Fernand Brodel, noted, the beginning of the 17th century witnessed a decline uh, in Ottoman power. And so, I quote, with remarkable zeal, the Jesuits and the Capuchins rallied to storm the tottering civilization. When the hopes of an, of an uprising collapsed, Fakhreddin fled to Italy, where he stayed for from 1613-1618 in Tuscany and in Naples with a visit to Malta. After his return from exile, he encouraged the Capuchins and the Friars, Friars Minor to settle missions and schools in Mount Lebanon, at the same time that he allowed Christian Maronites to migrate into Druze regions and build churches and monasteries. This is the Baclini uh, connection. In 1628, Pope Urban wrote to the Maronite Patriarch, Johanna Mahlouf, praising Fakhreddin and regretting his inability to help him realize his goal of independence from the Ottomans. He, en he ended his letter with these words, we shall not allow the church to blame us for not coming to your help, as you will call upon Europe to save the East by means of this great prince. Linguistic. Eager to take part in converting Muslims, Wadanyoli rewrote the Latin book in Arabic, opening with praise to Pope Urban VIII in Latin, a language that the latter uh, could read. Wadanyoli assured the Pope that with the weapons of the barbarian language, Arabic, he, the Pope, and the Church would, quote, fatally wound the Muslim depravity, after which the Muslims will voluntarily receive the sweetest yoke of Christ, on their neck. They will no more show themselves barbarians by their barbaric manners and impiety, but under the vicar of Christ, Barberini, they will take up the faith of Christ and receive the cognomen of Barberini. But Quadagnoli was not what we would call today an Orientalist, in the manner of Golius or Hottinger or, or Pocock. Much as he was esteemed by his fellow uh, clergy, he had serious scholarly uh, shortcomings. Linguistically, Guadagnoli knew Arabic, Arabic grammar, but he was far, very far from mastering its style. Pizzorusso correctly noted that he knew Arabic as a dead language. But Heberger called him, Heberger, called him one of the most distinguished Arabics in the service of the church. The errors he committed in the book, however, were many. Two examples, the strangest, I think will suffice. Guadagnoli called the black stone of the Kaaba, al-Hajar al-Asad, the happiest stone, Hajaran Mas'udan. And very embarrassing, <laughs> he derived the singular Zabr from the Quranic term for the book of Psalms, Zabur. Zabur is a singular and plural noun, and Zabur is penis. There are also historical errors. 
that Ali, for instance, was the son-in-law of Muhammad who killed Uthman and was subsequently killed by Muawiyah. Additionally, he treated the various qiraat of the Quran as nuskhat ukhra, other version, and ba'd nusakh other versions as well. I, just, I mention all the references, but I don't need to uh, mention them here. He made references to Mufassirin, exegetes, and to the biographers of the Prophet, mainly Abu al-Hassan Ahmad al-Bakri, medieval rendition of Al-Anwar wal Misbah al-Surur, which he called Kitab al-Anwar, but made no mention of the major interpreters who established Quranic theology from at tabari on. Importantly, Ibn Zayn al-Abidin, to whom the rebuttal had been written, was Shia, and the recipients in the region to where the Arabic translation would be sent were largely, although not exclusively, Druze, whose faith is an offshoot of Shiaism. Correctly, Wadani only noted that the Pharisee Yun, the Persians, he did not use the term Shia, did not accept much that was in Kutub as Sunnah, the books of the Sunnah, but that did not deter him from constantly citing Qutb Sunnah, or as he put it, usually, Qala Muhammad fi al Sunnah. He mentioned other books, Kitab Ismail, and he said, of which I found only one copy, Muhammad, and then another book. Muhammad authored a book with 12,000 ahadith, Kitab Hajar, by Muslim Faqih, which Quadaniol uh, used in describing the life of the Prophet and Kitab Tariq al Imam, which he used variously. Many of the books were uncanonical, some unknown, but Quadaniol treated them all as if they were authoritative. His book list is limited, again, if compared with what Orientalists consulted, which explains the frequent repetitions, the references to Zamakhshari's Qamus with its allusion to walad, interpreted as incarnation, appeared six times in the book. Now we come to the theological part, which is the more difficult part. Such inadequate mastery of the language, combined with the missionary obsession, desensitized Guadagnoli to the impact of his word usage, to his, the impact of his word usage on Arab readers, especially in the offensive terms he used for the Prophet and the Quran. In Apologia, Muhammad was ignorance, impostor, incestuosus, libernidus, picator, and superbus arrogance. In the Ijaba, Guadagnoli's insults appeared in Arabic and repeatedly. I will not read these terms, but they are the same as the terms he used in Latin, but now in Arabic. I will only mention one example where he describes uh, Muhammad as Laysa Aminan, not honest. And I think that was obviously a deliberate attempt to refute the epithet associated with Muhammad as Muhammad al Amin. The ad hominem attacks are pervasive and relentless and they appear in all discussions. How scholars can claim that Guadagnoli moderated his views is a mystery to me. The insults had never before been seen in print in the Arab East. Guadagnoli continued by introducing a new strategy of undermining the Prophet and the Quran from the words of the Quran itself. For instance, he selected a word such as gurur, pride, vanity, which was used in the Quran by unbelievers against the Prophet when they accused him of being inspired by Satan. Then, having explained the meaning of the word as it appears in the Quran, and showing that it was used in connection with Iblis, Satan, Guadagnoli applied it to the Prophet, thereby condemning the Prophet by his own words in the Quran. <coughs> Guadagnoli used the method again for the Quran. The Quran, he stated, was full of untruths and stories that were udhuka and madhaka, a joke repeated frequently again recalling the verse where unbelievers laughed at the Prophet and his verses of the Quran, Zuhruf 43. The conclusion for Guadagnoli was that the Quran had demonstrated the duplicity of the Prophet and its own falsity. In his, in his book, Kitab 
Ibn Zayn al-Abidin had methodically shown how much the Gospels were full of inaccuracies because they had been written by the four disciples. The error in the Injil were not in the original message of Jesus. <coughs> Excuse me. This argument had always been used by Muslim polemicists, and so to challenge it, Guadagnoli repeated the most common attack by Christians that the Quran was the work of Muhammad. Thus, Muhammad fil Quran. Qala Muhammad fil Quran, you know, Muhammad said, etc. And the book which Muhammad wrote, Kataba. Sometimes Guadagnoli had curious variants. The Quran said to Muhammad, or Qala Muhammad wal Quran, Muhammad and the Quran said. And the enigmatic reference to Asfar, the books of Muhammad. One of the attacks on the Prophet in the Quran by his enemies, for instance, accused him of being a poet, thereby denying him, uh, denying the Quran's divine origination. Guadagnoli agreed. How can one believe that the Quran is divinely revealed after one reads Homer's Iliada? I, I mean, I have them in Arabic. Virgil's Aeneid in Latin and uh, Atasso in his uh, Urushalim Liberat, in Jerusalem Liberated. Nobody can say that the poetry of the Quran is from God. <coughs> For Guadagnoli, the Quran was not a prophetic book, nor did it have a divine source. Laysa min Allah. Rather, and this gets very nasty, the Quran is given by Satan and repeated frequently in the active voice. Satan gave or wrote the Quran and the Quran's content is pride and mendacity. Further evidence of its mendacity appears to Guadagnoli in the assertion that Jews, Christians and Muslims will all attain eternal felicity after death. For Guadagnoli, such theological inclusivity was impossible. Muslims who followed the Qur'an's alleged teachings of war and violence could not be saved, unlike the Christians who followed the teachings of love and compassion. For Guadagnoli, the Qur'an was wrong to allow followers of the three monotheisms a place in salvation, or even that Satan too would be saved at the end of time. Such positions were unacceptable at a time when European Catholics were slaughtering and damning Protestants to hell and the other way around in the bloody Thirty Years' War. Guadagnoli added, how Muslims could claim that their religion had reached all the world when it was Christianity, not Islam, which had spread to all the corners of the earth. Islam did not even reach Italy. In fact, Islam was on the retreat as divinely demonstrated by the expulsion of the Muslims, the Andalusians, Moriscos, from Spain between 1609 and 1614. The Catholics of the Quran. After the relentless attacks, Guadagnoli turned to praise his own denomination of Christianity and to defend it against the Christianities that Ibn Zayn al Abidin had mentioned in his book. <coughs> the latter had referred to the theologies of the Melkites, the Armenians, the Franks, the Jacobites, and the Nestorians. The last two communities were populous in Persia and believed that, as a quote, the Virgin Mary did not bring forth God. Ibn Zayn al-Abidin wanted to show that Christians did not agree on the theology, because the theology was not divinely inspired, but was concocted by various sects. Guadagnoli concurred. The only Christians were the Catholics, Catholic Iyun, not those who had followed the Bida, the heresies of the first centuries concocted by Arius, Mani, Marcion, Photius, Nestor, and others. The reference to Photius pointed at the Orthodox Christians, and the, reference <laughs> and the reference to Nestor referred to the Nestorians, all targets of, Christian, uh, of Catholic missionaries in the Ottoman East. These, declared Cardanioli, were not Christians. The verses which denounced Christians were meant for heretics, because heretics were not called Christians. On the other hand, verses that praised Christians were meant for Catholics, 
the Christians who would be rewarded by God as the surahs of the cow and the table showed. Al-Nasara whom al katholikiyun the Christians are the Catholics. Those were the Christians who had been given Al-Kitab, the book, as the surah of the cow confirmed. More specifically, they were the ones obedient to the church of St. Peter, whose Khalifa was the Holy Father, Guadagnoli concluded it was incumbent on the Mohammedans in the light of the various Quranic verses to accept the authority of the father, Al-Ab, from the fathers of the church of the Christians and the teachings of a teacher from among the Christians, i.e. the Pope. The Figural Method For support of his position, Guadagnoli invoked evidence from Hipp Hippocrates, Plato, Politica, as he writes it, Aristotle, Athecia, Euclid, Cicero, John Chrysostom, Augustine, uh, City of God against Faustus, Eusebius, Philo, Justin Martin, Hermes, John Damascus, and church fathers whom, uh, whom Guadagnoli says, church fathers whom the Quran describes as believers in God and whose reward is with God, as well as church councils all the way until Trent. To validate his use of the evidence, Guadagnoli turned to the figural method of interpretation, of spiritualizing text while maintaining their historical truth. The method was alien to Islamic exegesis, and so Guadagnoli explained the relation between al-Shibh and al mushabba the similarity between both. And for pages on end, he quoted a verse from the Quran and showed how its true meaning could only be understood through its figural appearance in the Bible. Jonah prophesied the coming and, uh, and death of Christ because he was in the belly of the fish, Hud, for three days and three nights. As, end of quote. As the Old Testament was fulfilled in the New Testament, so was the Quran retro retroactively fulfilled in the Christian revelation. The Quran achieved its literal and figural meaning in the New Testament only in the New Testament. Referring to the surah of Az-Zukhruf, Guadagnoli concluded, quote, and this is from Guadagnoli, Christ came with clear proofs, and I have come to you with wisdom to clarify to you some of what you differ about. So fear Allah and obey me. End of quote. The Quran openly enjoyed obedience to the teachings of Jesus. And since Jesus had the power to change the law, what then you all concluded, how can Muslims repudiate him? End of quote. It's unclear how Ibn Zayn al-Abidin would have viewed this obscure method of interpretation, nor what he would have made of the vast number of references to church fathers, church councils, and numerous classical and ecclesiastical historians. Nor is it possible to imagine how he reacted to Guadagnoli's use of the Sibylline oracles. Towards the end of the book, and having tiresomely <laughs> overused his sources, Guadagnoli turned to the prophecies of al Batulat, the virgins, quote, who came from all over the world, the prophetesses, al Nabiyat, and others. He explained that writers ranging from Cicero to Virgil, uh, <coughs> Virgil to Cicero, to St. Augustine, had praised their poems as prophecies announcing the advent of Christ. Most prominently was Virgil, the poet who included the sayings of the Sibylines, uh, the Sibyls, about the incarnation, Tezshid, of God. Guadagnoli translated a poem from Latin and Greek into Arabic with an acrostic that spells Yesua al-Masih ibn Allah al-Mukhallis al-Salib. Again, an awkward Arabic construction following the uh, Latin acrostic, Jesus Christus de Filio. I have included a sample of that. I don't expect you to read it because it's unreadable. Uh, the translation, so this is part of it. It's like six or seven pages of that. Uh, the translation is pure gibberish. It's kind of the you know, under the, uh, yeah. Well, then you only admitted what was obvious, 
that he was bad at Arabic. What he thought, what he thought could be achieved by the meaningless array of lines is not clear, unless he wanted to overwhelm his interlocutor with sonorous words. Guadagnoli supported this position about the oracles by referring to the great Latin poet Virgil, who had mentioned them in his al ughluga al-Rabi'a, the fourth eglog. And so Guadagnoli translated into Arabic some lines from that eglog, the first translation ever, by the way, of this Virgilian poem into Arabic. The Quran, Virgil, and the Sibylline oracles, Guadagnoli concluded, all confirm the godhood of Christ. Nearing the end of the book, Guadagnoli, in his conclusion, assured his Muslim interlocutors that he cared very much for him and wanted to save him from eternal damnation. He did not want him to be like other Muslims who denied the divinity of Christ, yakfuru bil lahut, al-Masih. He promised to send Ibn Zayn al-Abidin various holy scriptures, religious texts, uh, printed in Arabic. Because, as he said, we seek your salvation. Raghibna fi khalasikum. He then appended a short address to the al qari al-Mahir, the adept reader, and to all those, I quote, to all those who seek to believe in the true God. The three unnumbered pages are milder in tone than the rest of the book. But then you'll recall the events that had led to the writing of the book we have written this book to show him the truth of Christianity. Guadagnoli was appealing to his interlocutor one-on-one, -on -one, treating him as an intellectual but erring counterpart. And this is the first quotation in the fly sheet. So now, you faqih, reader of our Discussions in this book about the mysteries of God, sorry, about the mysteries of God and of the law of Christ, discern the fallacies of pride so you know the truth of Christ and distinguish it from what the Quran and Muhammad said. Examine what Christ has said and whether it is true or false and rejoice in the truth of Christ and his gospel and all the scriptures. If until now, you had not believed in Christ, rejoice, for now you have learned about him, his truth, in this, our book. It's unlikely that Ibn Zayn al-Abidin rejoiced. The index and the table of contents that follows are full of the same insulting terms that had appeared in the book about Islam, the Prophet, and the Quran. And they're kind of cross-listed, they're summarized. I mean, it's an exhaustive, it's an exhaustive uh, table of contents. As was the plan, the Ijaba traveled to the Arab East. Francesco Ingoli, secretary of Gandafidi, claimed in a report of 1642 that a Muslim of Alexandria converted to Christianity after reading this book. He cited this conversion as an illustration of the efficacy of the printed word and the importance of disse disseminating books in Arabic. Although that a Muslim read a badly written and repetitive and complicated 1,000-page book and then converted is not easy to believe. In 1646, the French Jesuit missionary, Jean Amieu, wrote in a praise of Guadagnoli, I quote, the apology of, the, of Philippe Guadagnoli from the Order of Prize Minor, written to, in response to Hamid, etc., etc., the apology treated treats of Muhammad and of his Quran from page 321 to page 700. Amir had arrived in Aleppo in 1635 and must have received the book from one of the traveling Maronites. He read it carefully. The page references are nearly accurate and he may well have used the book in his preparation of a response to a letter he had received from a Mohammedan a few years earlier in 1641. With the publication and distribution of the Ijaba, Yusuf's goal was achieved. There was now an Arabic book in the hands of the missionaries in the Arab East that demolished Islam, denounced the Prophet and the Quran, and praised the Catholic Church.
you just give me a couple of minutes and uh, <coughs> the Barahin, 1649, the reversal of argument. Back in Rome, Guadagnoli was continuing his advocacy of mission. In 1642, he approved the Propaganda Fide publication of Bellarmine's De Doctrina Christiana with an Arabic-Italian facing translation. He also published his book on Arabic grammar and prosody, again through Propaganda Fide, and again, quote, at the hands of the lowly deacon Yusuf al Baslukiti of the late Hilal family in the blessed Mount Lebanon, end of quote. Yusuf had been impressed by Guadagnoli's storm and so continued his support of his conversionary effort to Muslims. Guadagnoli revised, rewrote the Ijaba, and in 1649, the Barahin came out in print. Again, the frontispiece of the Barahin mentioned Yusuf from Blessed Mount Lebanon. The British Library catalog includes a note stating that Yusuf revised uh, the text, and the Library of Congress catalog identifies the authors of the text as Guadagnoli and al Baslukiti. Neither, neither library offers any evidence in support of these statements. Sorry. The errata that had been listed in the last pages of the Ijaba are corrected. And importantly, the Ijaba's index was extensively reduced. Guadagnoli repeated many of the arguments in the Ijaba, but now he reversed, contradicted the position he had firmly upheld in the Ijaba. He declared, to Al-Faqi Ahmad, as well as to Muslim, Muhammad Yun, that the Quran did not contradict the Gospel. La yudadid al-Injil. This position ran contrary to his views in the Ijaba, where he had based his arguments on the fact that the Quran contradicted the Bible. Yudadid al-Quran al-Kitab al-Muqaddas wal-Tawrah wal-Injil. This reversal was in reaction to the view of Ibn Zayn al-Abidin, who had confirmed the khilaf, the difference, between the teaching of the Qur'an and teachings of the New Testament, because the latter teachings had been distorted. Now, 12 years later, Guadagnoli explained that the Qur'an did not oppose, la yudadid, the Gospel, and he did it so at the very beginning of the book. In this approach, Guadagnoli moved from the traditional argument that the Qur'an validated the Christian religion to the argument that the Quran, if interpreted correctly, actually preached the Christian religion. The Quran was no longer an Islamic text with its own theology, but a pseudo-Christian text. This polemic against the Quran as a pseudo-Christian text recalls the Morisco polemic in the lead books. Uh, in 1645, uh, these books had reached Rome, and Guadagnoli was tasked, along with others, to examine them. The books, a forgery, presented a Muslim interpretation of Christianity by masquerading as scriptures of the first century AD that had been hidden in, the, in what became known as the Sacramonti. They were a Morisco polemic against a Christianity that was intent on expelling the Moriscos. The manner, of this Morisco, uh, the manner of this polemic was to present new but allegedly ancient and revealed Christian scriptures, which corrected Christians' distorted interpretation of the New Testament. According to the books, Christians were in error, and only by adopting the Islamic view propounded in the books, in the lead books, would they arrive at true Christianity. Christianity was aligned with the Quran. The books presented the polemic through Mary's preaching to Jacobo, son of Shamech, the Zebedee, the apostle, 52 days after the death of Christ and resurrection. While the visions she described in the book were fantastical, at the basis was the affirmation that there was no God but God, with no reference to Christianity's incarnation, crucifixion, 
or Trinity. And so Guadagnoli Christianized the Islamic scriptures in the manner that the Moriscos Islamicized the Christian scriptures. Instead of denouncing the Prophet and the Quran, he would Christianize the latter and therefore delegitimize it, as the lead books had delegitimized the New Testament. The Mohammedans, wrote Guadagnoli, must understand and therefore confirm the evidence for Christianity in the Quran. Guadagnoli wanted to make sure that Muslims read and understood their Quran correctly and not in the manner they mistakenly approached it. Because the Quran stated, Qala, what the Injil, the Evangelion, the Gospel, had said about Christian doctrine. After citing the verse from the Quran about Christ being God's word sent into Mary, he stated, and this is the second quotation on your sheet. I don't know if I have that. Well, it's somewhere. From this statement in the Quran, which is repeated frequently, it's evident that the Quran professed the two mysteries, the Trinity and the Godhead of Christ. I wonder at Muslims how they can deny these two great mysteries, since the Quran fully uh, admitted to the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. Indeed, the Quran openly stated that Christ is the Word of God and the Spirit from God. It seems they believe in the Quran, but they do not believe what the Quran says. They must believe in the Quran in order to understand the Quran's statement that Christ is the Word of God and not a physical world, but a spiritual world. And then another quote For you, Ahmad al Sharif al Faqih, he continued to eradicate the error that has stuck in your mind and to believe in this mystery of the Incarnation, take, understand, accept, and use your reason. The Quran did not contradict the Gospel and what God had said. Ergo, concluded Guadagnoli, the Quran stated that Christ is God and the Son of God. Al-Sharh al-Haqiqi. The key for properly understanding the mystery lay in the Sharh al-Haqiqi, the true method of interpretation, a figural reading sanctioned by God, because al-Haqiqi, al-Haq, Haqiqi, is one of the 99 names of God in the Quran. For Guadagnoli, the view to the, the way to the true meaning of the Quran was through Christ and Christianity even though the number of verses in the Quran about both is quite small, 210 verses. God spoke through the Injil, Afan Badinyoli, which is, quote, why he, Muhammad, in the Surah of Yunus, urged that the verses of the Quran should be interpreted by means of the verses of the Injil. Muslim, end of quote. Muslims, continued Badinyoli, should, quote, apply their minds very, very carefully to what I say, because the Quran stated, as the Injil stated, as we stated before, the Quran mentioned God and the Word of God and the Ruh of God, the Spirit of God. It does mention the Trinity. Although he was familiar with the theory of Nasr, having noted how Muhammad Nasr abrogated 150 sayings in the Quran, Guadagnoli asserted that without the Injil correcting the Quran, the latter was nothing but a text full of ignorance and mendacity and falsity. You people, Guadagnoli wrote towards the end of the book, should believe in the divinity of Christ, the Trinity and the Holy Church, as they are presented in the Quran. Only then will you find truth and attain, attain eternal life. The truth of the New Testament was the key to the Quran to the Quran. Impact of Barahim. Guadagnoli's arguments for non-contradiction between Bible and Quran, disingenuous as they were, proved alarming. And in 1653, the Barahim was censored and Guadagnoli was rebuked. As one scholar has noted to Borchio, quote, during the final years of his life, Guadagnoli struggled against censorship by his superiors at the Vatican due to the allegedly <laughs> 
allegedly, <coughs> allegedly over sympathetic approach to the Quran displayed in the Arabic versions of the Apologia. It doesn't exactly mention which version. Another scholar, by far better, Trentini, has commented that the church failed to recognize the value of Gadagnoli's Sol Soluzioni Originali, the original solution, in trying to bring Muslims to his side. That in the Barahin, Guadagnoli circumvented Muslim hostility by showing how the two revelations were alike. The church, she concluded, should have known better that Guadagnoli was not presenting Christianity to Muslims outside the teachings of Rome. Noel Malcolm stated that the Barahin was, quote, even conciliatory in tone. For scholars to blame the church for failing to appreciate Guadagnoli's original solution or for rebuking him for his allegedly over-sympathetic uh, approach in the Barahin ignores these fundamental facts. First, Guadagnoli was dictating to Muslims how they should read the Quran and telling them that the true meaning of the Quran lay in the Christian content. Such a view is anti-Islamic, not conciliatory. For Muslims, it was the Quran that corrected the New Testament, not the other way around. The New Testament could not, was not, a corrective. Secondly, in the first part of the Barahin, Guadagnoli eliminated his derogatory references to the Prophet and the Quran. But in every chapter starting from the second book of the fourth section, Guadagnoli pointed to alleged contradictions in the Quranic description of the Prophet. He then warned that unless there was a Christian tafsir, Christian interpretation, the text would confirm the Prophet as, it's a horrible sentence, but I read it in Arabic, غير عالم كان أميا وأنه كان فاسق وزاني ومعاصي الله وما شابه ذلك. A totally incoherent Arabic sentence, basically repeating that he's evil, a totally, or that Muhammad was unlettered, meaning ignorant, or that he, uh, or that he many times lusted for obscene pleasures. What well, Daniel wanted to save Muslims from believing that Muhammad had been such a man, that he had committed adultery and was libidinous, or that he had lied. So what he did was he listed alleged episodes in the life of Muhammad and alleged errors in the Quran. He then urged the reader at the end of each chapter to interpret the Quran with the New Testament uh, method of sharh, interpret his sharh. But much as he listed alleged aberrations, he never applied, he never applied his method of sharh to any of these hostile descriptions. He repeated the same attacks on the Prophet he had advanced in Ijaba, but now appearing to want to refute them. And they could only be refuted if Muslim readers accepted the New Testament tafsir interpretation, i.e. if they converted. With scholastic incisiveness, Guadagnoli left the Muslim reader with one of two choices, either to admit the Prophet was evil, or to accept the corrected Christian interpretation of the Quran. In other words, recognize the Quran as a pseudo, a pseudo scripture. Thirdly, Guadagnoli corrected the Quran by using the divinely revealed Christian scripture in the manner that the lead books were used by the Morisco authors as divine scriptures to correct Christianity and the scriptures. To arrive at the sawab, correct, approach of, to the Quran, Muslims needed to learn from the Injil, from the Gospel. In the same manner, the Christian needed to learn their true Christianity from Mary and their revelation of the truth of the Gospel in the lead books. That way, Muslims would recognize that the Quran confirmed Christ as God and the Son of God. Like the Ijaba and Barahin, uh, like the Ijabati, Barahin traveled widely. 
Whether Ibn Zayn al-Abidin ever got to read it is not known. He died a year after its publication in 1650. But in Oxford, <coughs> Edward Pocock read it, and in its translation to Arabic of Grotius's De Veritati Religionis Christiana, which was published in 1660, he disagreed with Guadagnoli, with Guadagnoli. Specifically, he used the word yudad, you know, opposed, confirm, to confirm that the teaching of the new Sharia of Islam uh, did indeed contradict, did indeed contradict the religion of Christ. It was, and the way he puts it, it was opposite to it, even though superficially, Shazahir al Alfaz, it appeared to correspond to many of the stories of the Christians. Simultaneously in Aleppo, an anonymous writer praised El Padre Filippus Codagnolis, Clericus Mayor, Ila Ahmed al Sharif ibn Zayn al Abidin al Farisi, after reading the Barahin. In a manuscript of 60 quarter pages, the writer lifted passages verbatim from the original Arabic to show that Muhammad fi Quranihi, again he repeats the same uh, uh, phrase, repeat. Uh, confirmed the Bible. The Quran actually extolled Madaha, the Injil, the, the Gospel, and the other books of the Bible. In 1679, the Maronite Bishop Butrus Makhlouf wrote Muftah al-Biha, Key to the Church, in Arabic Karshuni, uh, while staying in Rome, intended for his fellow Maronite uh, monks, uh, their Marshaya, in Lebanon, for the Antonines, who could read Arabic and Syriac script, he summarized a hundred pages from Gadaniol's book. Confronted, he ended with the help of God. We have finished the summaries from the book of the questions which Ahmed the Fakai had sent to Rome, in which he had queried the Holy Church, the Holy Office in Rome. The copyist indicated that he finished, finished recopying the work in February 1692, showing how much Guadagnoli's refutation of Islam was still appreciated by the co-religionist of Yusuf al basluqiti Final questions. Within 30 years of its establishment in 1622, the propaganda fide had produced the longest and the most comprehensive theological attacks on Islam in Arabic print. So what is the significance of these books in the history of Christian Islamic encounter? First, the Catholic approach to conversion. The Ijaba and the Barahin were written by a man with a mission to convert Muslims. In so doing, Guadagnoli showed the unaccommodating character of Catholic mission at least unaccommodating towards Arab readers. For him and his church, converting the unbelievers to Christianity required total transformation of the convert into a new Christian, made in the image of Tridentine Christianity. And of course, the new Christian had to pledge allegiance to the Khalifa in Rome, the Pope. Guadagnoli's Arabic books challenge views by scholars that Catholic mission in the early modern period adopted, adapted to the new geographies, new cultures, and new encounters. While in the Catholic Native American encounter in Mexico, for instance, conversion was syncretism, implying a halfway meeting between complementary elements, in the Arab East there was no halfway. Simon Ditchfield, in an important article, wrote that the tsunami of Catholic missionary literature between 1500 and 1700, quote, changed how European Catholics thought about their own indigenous religious practices and the methods used in mission uh, in Asia and Americas. The missionary encounter with the American Indians may have challenged European culture, forcing, as he continued, a recalibration of what it meant to be Christian, his words. But in the Arab East, there was no middle ground between theologies. And as Guatagnoli demonstrated in 2,000 plus pages, no tsunami 
ever blew away his approach to the mission directed at Muslims. Conversion was not a pathway to cross-cultural encounters that flowed back through the Western mission movement and shaped European worldviews. Conversion was Romanization. And for the Christian and Muslim re Arab readers in Aleppo or Jerusalem or Bislukit, Jesus was a Medici in Florence as the illustration, and that's on your, sh on your sh a sheet, yes. It's from the 1590. Uh, he was a Medici in Florence, as the illustration New Testament Medici copy showed him, not of Bethlehem, where my father was born, nor of Nazareth, where my mother was raised. The disregard of the Christian Arabic legacy. Guadagnoli disregarded the vast literature written by Christian Arabs in their history of encounters and engagements with Islam. He was writing in Arabic and for Arabs, and yet he never mentioned a single, he never mentioned a single Arabic, a Christian Arabic contribution, especially, for instance. Abdel Masih al Kindi's apologetic, which had been the most widely read in medieval period. Nor did he take account of the numerous Arabic debates and disputations between Christians and Muslims, which were being copied and recopied in various Catholic and Antiochian Orthodox scriptoria of the Arab East during his lifetime. These writings presented exchanges that were re respectful of the Prophet even offered praise. Theodore Abu Qurra in 781, who will not praise and honor and venerate Muhammad? He addressed the caliph, who fought for the sake of God and would, not with word only, but also with the sword, most evident in his zeal for the most high creator. In Guadagnoli's own lifetime, the Arabic Latin renditions of two medieval Christian historians of early Islam, al makin and Ibn al-Batriq, presented a respectful description of the Prophet. The tradition of Christian Arabs praising the Prophet of Islam, along with Ali and Hussein, continued well into the 20th century, from Egypt and Palestine to Syria and Lebanon. Third, directions. The books, the two books, were prepared during a period of Christian Catholic uh, triumphalism. After Islam had been defeated in Iberia and the converted Moriscos expelled. At the same time, the Ottomans were weakened by fighting the Persians, and as of 1645, they were laying siege to Crete, but unable to conquer the capital, Candia, until 1669. Against this background, Guadagnoli never questioned his project of evangelization. But his certitude was not, was not shared. His certitude was not shared by other religious writers in the changing theological and intellectual landscape of the early modern period. To Guadagnoli's north, and a decade after his death, a cobbler in prison, who would become one of the greatest spiritual writers in early modern England, wondered in honest humility. Quote, how can you tell that the Turks, the Muslims, had as good a scripture to prove that Muhammad the Savior as we have to prove our Jesus is? End of quote. Thus, John Bunyan, in Grace Abounding in the Chief of Sinners, 1666. And Henry Stubb, his contemporary, but a graduate of Christ, Christ Church College, where the first wrote the first treatise ever in Europe to praise the Prophet Muhammad and the Quran. And the reason Stab was able to arrive at the praise was because he went back to the Christian Arabic sources on the Prophet and on the Quran, the sources that Guadagnoli did not deign to mention. As he wrote in the Rise and Progress of Muhammadanism, and that's the third a quotation, the Al-Quran is written in Arabic verse. It's not one con continued poem, but a collection of sundry surahs or poems, 
which Muhammad published occasionally. The language, the numbers, the style are all so exquisite, inimitable, that Muhammad himself though frequently urged this as the ground authentic, the ground authentic testimony of his apostleship, that the Quran thus surpass all human wit and fancy, and offered to to be counted an impostor if any man could but try ten verses equal to any there, any therein. God by Muhammad took a better course by leaving to mankind one lasting miracle, the truth whereof should in all ages be satisfactory and convincing. Even though Henry Stubb did not know Arabic, and even though his treatise was not published until modern times, in his surprising work, he signaled a beginning, just a beginning, of a new direction for the European Quran. Thank you.